Well, welcome back, everyone. So as you can see on the screen, uh, Danny Lopez is up uh, with today's brown bag uh, about the bystander effect. Danny? So hello, Salsita. Welcome to the brown bag, which is titled, Why Does Nobody Help Me When I Ask? The Bystander Effect. And this story starts, as many interesting stories do, with the murder most foul. The place was New York, the year 1964, and it was Friday, the Friday the 13th, at 3 a.m. <clears throat> and the woman called Kitty Genovis, 28-year-old eight, bartender, she was returning from home from working at the bar, and she was approached by a man with a knife who assaulted and stabbed her. She screamed for help, but no help ever came. And there have been, you know, thousands of murders in the world and in New York, and so you might be wondering why this is particular one interesting. Well, because there were 37 witnesses to it, <clears throat> the whole assault took over 30 minutes, during which the victim managed to escape her attacker twice, only to be caught and attacked by him again. <clears throat> and nobody did anything, nobody even called the police until long after she was dead. <clears throat> And this is, as you can see, the New York Times article that was published about it. And well, the case became famous. People were shocked about it, like they could not understand how none of these witnesses even did anything, even called the police or an ambulance or something. So this inspired a lot of psychological research on a topic that was called the bystander effect, or also the Genovese syndrome, named after this uh, woman. <clears throat> So let's back up here for a second. So what exactly is the bystander effect? So it's the social psychological claim that individuals are less likely to offer help in emergency situations when other people are present. So generally, the greater the number of bystanders or people who are witnessing some situation, the less likely it is that one of them or any of them will help. <clears throat> And it's a strongly uh, proven phenomenon, and it occurs in many experimental and situations in the field as well. So you might be wondering why I'm talking about this, because it's unlikely that we will ever be in an, this sort of situation. Well, first of all, that's not entirely true. There's a lot of people in this like presentation right now, plus the video will be published to the whole internet, where potentially billions of people, but more likely dozens or so, will see it. <clears throat> and statistically, some of us will be in an emergency situation at some point. Probably, hopefully, we will not be witnessing a murder, but knowing about this can help in other you know, emergency cases. Most importantly, it also applies to non-emergency cases, and the effect is stronger the less dangerous the situation is perceived to be. And specifically, my reason to talk about this is that I've seen it happen at work in Salsita and in previous jobs, and I'm pretty sure all of us have. Like, you know, you just think about it, you ask a group for something, hoping that one person will help you and nobody does it, Code reviews are posted on Slack, and often nobody looks at them unless there is a specific person who has to do it, or unless somebody reminds them later or something. Someone mentions they are struggling with an issue in a meeting, nobody offers to help. You ask in a channel where the whole company is for somebody to do a brown bag, and nobody reacts. And well, people notice that something should be done in general, and nobody does it. <clears throat> And of course, this has ne negative consequences because you know things do not get done, or they get done later than they could have, or there are misunderstandings, or you think people are lazy, or they dislike you because none of them want to help you, or the people who are aware of the bystander effect are the ones who are proactively trying to counter it, and they have taken care of a lot of things. <clears throat> Yeah, and if you remember my last brown bag, you'll remember this point too. Like, this is not a criticism of anyone. I'm not saying, I know that everyone I've worked with here are like very hard workers, and this is just like how the human brain works. So the fact that we tend not to volunteer if there are more people <coughs> Uh, available doesn't mean that we are lazy or bad people or like anything like that. It just makes us human. Also, the good news, is that this is very easy to counter. So just making people aware of it seems to help reduce it. So this is my goal like for this presentation, to make us all aware of the bystander effect and to get us to understand some of the reasons behind it and we can do and what we can do about them. So we are able to counter it in our you know work lives or our real lives as well. 
So today, what we will cover, like first we will <clears throat> talk a bit about the science, what factors are impacting uh, the bystander effect. And then there is this bystander intervention model, which tells us what steps are necessary for help to be given. Then we will go over the underlying explanations on what, why this effect happens and what to do about them. Also, there's a confession I have to make to all of you. And in the end, there will be some conclusions. <clears throat> so what is the typical uh, bystander effect? Like there were a lot of experiments done, so there's a lot of variety, so as you would expect. But in general, they all share most of these characteristics. So the experiments basically fabricate some situation in which one or more subjects are asked to perform a task. So like fill some form, have a discussion or whatever, but that's just an excuse. And generally it's irrelevant for the experiment. And they are not told, of course, that. They just think that the task is the important thing that they are there for. And they are not told what the experiment is really about until you know afterwards, if at all. But during that task, oh, surprise, something happens. They are faced with a situation in which maybe they could intervene. And yeah, then there's generally at least two independent variables. So the, the experiments vary the number of people who are involved in the situation and can respond, basically the number of subjects or bystanders. And the other being the condition that like you may want to evaluate how this impacts the bystander effect. So for example, the gender of the victim or the distance between the bystander and the victim or the dangerousness of the situation. And then they measure like either the rate of response, so how many people help in the situation or how the delay is how long it takes them to respond to the situation or both or some related metrics. And yeah, then like after they have the data, they see how the willingness to help correlates with the number of people and the other condition. And, you know, if some condition makes subjects less likely to help, that's, you know, if there are more people, it, that reinforces the bystander effect. If it makes them more likely to help, if there are more people, this the condition inhibits the bystander effect. And of course, then they come up with theories that explain all this data and <coughs> so on. So what are the, the conditions that like impacted more most like luckily there were some very nice people who did some meta-analysis on these experiments so i didn't have to read all of them and do that uh, so we have a good idea on what factors have the highest impact i chose some of them here <clears throat> also interestingly they <clears throat> They also evaluated factors that reduce the bystander effect so they make people more likely to help in the bigger groups and yeah, then here in this slide, I'm, or in general, I'm using the word bystander for the experiments to refer to the subjects of the experiments, the people who could have intervened in the situations and who, you know, the experiment was measuring if they intervened or not. So generally, the more bystanders there are, the less help it, like the less likely they are to help. If the situation is not an emergency. Uh, <clears throat> The, the bystander effect is reinforced, so people help less, which is bad news for us because at work, usually our situations are, you know, not such big emergencies. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, if you tell people to be passive, like the more people there are, the less of them will actually do something. And in emergency situations, if bystanders are uh, strangers, they are less likely to offer help. Uh, but the bystander effect is actually reduced if the situation is perceived as dangerous or if there is a perpetrator, like some attacker or somebody who's committing a crime or a bad thing, and this per person is present, like probably because like both of the, the above are because like if you have more people to help, you maybe need these people to like to stop the situation if it's dangerous than if you are alone. Uh, also, if the bystander is competent in the specific area of, of the emergency, of like if it's a medical emergency, like if the, the person has medical training, they are more likely to, to help even if they are alone, and, or even if there are other people who would cause them not to help. <clears throat> of course, if other bystanders are competent, uh, that also uh, like impacts it. If there's the instruction to be active, as opposed to the other one, like people will tend to help no matter what. And if but the bystanders are familiar with each other, but the, the situation is an emergency, which doesn't help us usually because, you know, as I mentioned, our sit work situations are uh, not really emergencies often. And there are some factors that 
don't impact it. So if there's physical risk to the victim, but not the bystander, like there doesn't seem to be an effect on the number of people and their willingness to help. Or there are things like gender of the victim, distance between the subject, the relation between the subject and the victim. And like, unfortunately for us, as I mentioned, in non-emergency situations, the familiarity among the bystanders uh, is not helping reduce the effect. It's also not increasing it though. So yeah, that's not helping us like in Salsita to get our things done. So <clears throat> let's go for the bystander intervention model. As I mentioned, this is an interesting result of the research was this, this five-step model of what needs to happen in order for people to provide help. And like every step is kind of well, uh, determined are well clearly defined by certain experiments so it's it's known that this has happened it's proven so the steps are first you have to notice that something is happening and then you have to interpret that what is happening is an emergency or is some situation in which you can intervene and then you have to take personal responsibility for actually assisting then determine what to do and then well do it obviously all the steps are necessary there's kind of short circuit evaluation like in here. So if the first step is not fulfilled, the second will not be even evaluated and no help will be given. Mm, let's dig down a bit deeper on those. So first step is to notice that something is happening or that something is wrong. And there's an experiment showing how being with more people will cause you to take longer to notice things. Like there were some students in a room filling a form and then smoke appeared and there were like different situations, different numbers of students in this experiment. So in the first case, there was a student alone. In the second, there was a student with two confederates, which means that's people, that's a term that is used for people who are working for the experimenter. So they are aware of the experiment. And in this case, they had instructions to engage with the subject as little as possible and ignore the smoke. And the third case, there were three naive subjects. So this is the time that it took them to notice the smoke. That's the mean uh, time as it was calculated. So as you can see, like the one, there was one person alone in five seconds they managed. When there were three people, like it took them around 20 seconds to even notice that there was some uh, smoke coming out of them vent. And <clears throat> yeah, I also have a real example of how we sometimes fail at this step. Um, during a stand-up in Salsita, someone in the team who I will not mention, yeah, they said that they were struggling with an issue. And like this person is very competent and you know almost always handles everything independently by themselves. So nobody noticed that this was their way of you know asking for help. So nobody did anything. Next step is to actually interpret the event as an emergency. So in the case uh, from before, the smoke kept filling the room and eventually like it was impossible to actually see or it was very difficult to see. It was getting progressively more and more uncomfortable. And after six minutes, the people like the experimenter stopped and opened, like let people out because uh, it was clear that they didn't do anything in six minutes when it was impossible to see, they would not do anything anymore. And yeah, so this is the percentage of people who actually reported something before the six minutes were, were over. And note that for the third group, this 38% represents that any of the three test subjects who were all actual subjects reported anything. So if one single person, 78% of the cases will report the, the smoke before the six minutes. If there were three people, even if none of them was aware of the experiment, only 38% of cases and any of the three people uh, reported anything. So yeah, following the real example from before, <clears throat> during the next day, they stand up. This person from before that was asking for help, they said that they were still struggling with the issue. And it, at that, day, that point, they even asked if somebody might have some idea about it and could help. And again, like nobody really took that as a you know call for help. Everyone like assumed this person would solve it in the end, or at least I did, and I think the rest of us also did. We didn't, we just had trust that this person would be able to do it, so we didn't think intervention intervention was necessary. And the next step is to actually take personal responsibility for providing help. And of course, we have another experiment. 
Uh, there were some subjects who were like having a discussion about some live problems and it was done like remotely. They were all in different rooms. They knew how many subjects there were, but they didn't know, like they, they didn't get to see them. If this was done before anonymity reasons in theory. And one of them mentioned that he was prone to have seizures and later on they, he had a seizure. And again, the more people that were part of the experiment, the less likely each of them was to help. Okay, sorry, uh, here it is. And this, this shows in the graph, like the time that it took them to, to respond. So in a two person group, like the times were much faster than in a three or six people group. And even in, <clears throat> in the two person group, like in the two person group means like the person and the, the fake person who had the seizure. So <clears throat> in the two person group, everyone, or like everyone when they were alone were able to to provide help or to go out and like figure out what was going on or to tell the experimenter or something. In the three and six people group, some people, in some cases, nobody did like anything. And from the reactions, they all students were nervous and they seemed to believe that the seizure was real. So the problem was not in the two earlier steps, it was in this, in this step. They didn't take the responsibility because they thought somebody else would. <clears throat> And the example I was following, like I was mentioning before, about the person asking for help in the stand-up, luckily ends here. The person eventually asked for help more openly. It actually took a couple times, but somebody in the team eventually felt responsible and helped. <clears throat> and there's another real-life example that you like quite recent that I'd like to mention. Like if you noticed in the brown box Slack channel, like this week, Razi posted that he cannot find anyone willing to present brown box. And if nobody volunteers, we might cancel them. <clears throat> and I think it was quite clear from the message that there was something going on and that it required at least one person to do something, probably more ideally. And like nobody reacted for like over 30 minutes. And the first reaction was actually mine. It was just a list, a list of ideas. And in the end, like only two people reached out to Razi priva privately, volunteering to solve the problem. And one of them was Matt, which I'm not sure if I should count him for that. Uh, so yeah, my explanation for why is here. There's 82 people in the channel. So probably everybody felt like someone else would do it. And if not, well, it's not like any of us can be blamed individually because, you know, after all, there were 82 people. So, yeah. And just to be clear, as I said before, I'm not saying this as a criticism. The point of the whole presentation is that the reason for people not to volunteer is not that they are lazy or bad or stupid or anything. It's just that it's ingrained in human nature and it just needs this conscious effort to break it. So first step is to determine what uh, actions are necessary. So once you have decided to act, you must figure out how. Turns out that if you don't feel competent to do so, you're less likely to do that, which, okay, makes sense. Uh, another experiment, we had some subjects performing a drawing task and a worker outside the room fell. Uh, and there were four types of groups, either nurses or not, or people who were alone or not. And basically, <clears throat> All the people reported that they were aware of the emergency and they were responsible for helping, so they fulfilled the first three steps. But the nurses were not affected by the bystander effect, so even if they were in a group, they helped as much as non-nurses who were alone or nurses who were alone as well. And this step is usually not a problem for us because I think <clears throat> everyone I've worked with in Salsita and in other jobs is quite good at their job. And like, so once they've decided to take a problem upon themselves, they will um, have like full confidence that they will manage to crack it. <clears throat> and the last step, you know, once the first step is done, people have decided how to provide help. The last step just kind of comes naturally. <clears throat> like in the vast majority of cases, help is provided. <clears throat> So now let's move to the more applicable part of the talk and talk about the reasons this happens and what to do about them. So the first reason I want to talk about is ambiguity. This affects the first two steps, noticing and interpreting the event as an emergency. <clears throat> so yeah, if this is what happened in the example I mentioned where someone needed help but was not explicitly saying during the stand-up. People maybe didn't notice or they didn't interpret it as a call for help. So what can we actually do about it? So if you are the person who needs help, make it clear that you need help and explain what 
you need. Like explain if the situation permits it, explain what is the problem and like go more into more detail. But if not, just tell the people clearly what to do. And if you are in a situation where like you think someone might need help, but in this case you are not sure because of the ambiguity, like confirm it. Like if you can ask them or like just like if you cannot ask them, assume that it's an it's that, that, that they do need help especially if the situation might be an emergency. Like in an emergency, it's better to overreact than call for help, call the you know, police or the ambulance or do something than underreact. <clears throat> Second reason is something called <clears throat> pluralistic ignorance. So in unclear situations, you, we often use other people's reactions as a heuristic. So you look at other people and if you see that the other people are not acting, you tend to think that nothing needs to be done because nobody is doing anything. And this is a situation where, you know, social proof can act against our interests. If you remember the smoke experiment, having other people that are not doing anything makes you kind of trust them that the situation is not an emergency and thus less likely to act or do something yourself. And so the, it reinforces, like each, each of the, the more people that are, the worse this is because they reinforce each other. And so what can we do about this? So again, if you're in need of help and people don't seem to be getting it, make it very clear that you want help and explain the situation and what sort of help do you need. And if you are in a situation where there are other people and you think there is a possible emergency going on, don't trust other people to know that the situation is fine because they are probably taking, looking at you and seeing that you are not doing anything and they are taking your inaction as proof that nothing is to be done the same way as you consciously or not are taking their inaction as proof that nothing needs to be done. <clears throat> uh, the next step, I think this is probably the most important one, most important reason, and at least in our regular work lives, because if there are many people responsible for something, the responsibility is you know, diffused between all of them. So each individual feels less responsible than more people that could be like handling the situation, which often I've seen ends up on the process failing in this step. And I think the Razi's request in the Brambach channel is a great example of this. Other examples would be sometimes you have some like pull requests that are posted in some Slack channel and like sometimes it takes extra reminding that something needs to be done because there's usually multiple people who can like who can take care of them. So yeah. In this case, again, if like the important thing to do is to make one person responsible or more if necessary, and ideally identify them very clearly, call them out by name if you know the name, or you know, in, if you don't, just point at them or describe them and just make it, or you know, if it's in work situation, message them privately on Slack or tag them or something. And and make sure that <clears throat> you let them know what exactly like is the situation and what they, they need to do. And in, in a work con context, you will probably have a decent idea of who can help. And if you don't and you get it wrong, don't worry. The person will know that they are not the best person to help. And since you have made them responsible, they will easily tell you who, who that person is, or they will be, you know, they will have now this responsibility to pass the, the responsibility to the person who can actually handle it. And yeah, if you are the bystander in this situation, notice it, predict that if somebody has asked a lot of people, nobody will do it. Feel fully, fully responsible yourself. And if you are not the right person to handle it, just find who is or raise up the issue. And yeah, another like uh, cause of this is unfamiliarity with the environment. So the less familiar you are, the less likely you are to understand that something is wrong or to interpret it as an emergency or to feel responsible to do something about it. And the good news, as I mentioned before, is that in Celsita, we're surrounded with competent people who are very familiar with the problems that are arising. So that's usually not a problem here, but sometimes there are a few areas where we are less familiar. So what can we do about it? Like if you are in need of help, or you notice that somebody needs help, you're already ahead of the of the mass. Uh, 
basically follow the same principles as before. Make it clear you want help, make a person responsible. And especially if you think that these other people are unfamiliar as well, focus on asking them to find help, not to provide it, because they, if you ask them pro to provide help and, if, and they don't know how to do that, they might not do anything. And if you are the bystander, uh, <clears throat> be extra aware and try to notice something might be wrong, and what, figure out what sort of help is needed and figure out who can provide it. And now it's time for the confession. I lied to you. If you remember the article I mentioned at the beginning about the murder where nobody helped, I told you the story as it was originally reported in the article. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, years later it was discovered that the article was slightly inaccurate or maybe grossly inaccurate. The number of witnesses was smaller than it had been reported and most of them were not even clearly aware of the situation. And some of them actually did help, like a man like shouted at the perpetrator and scared him away. Some woman called the police and an ambulance, and the ambulance actually arrived uh, in the scene while the victim was still alive, though she died on the way to the hospital. So as Mark Twain said, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And despite the story being exaggerated, the research that it inspired solidly proved the existence of the bystander effect. And it's partially thanks to the article that the research happened. Uh, so that now there's a positive side on that because we know now better about this condition and what we can do about it. So conclusions about this. Hopefully I've been able to convince you that the bystander effect is real and that generally the more people that are responsible for something, the less likely it is that they will help and that it affects all of us, of course. And it's also that it has a negative effect in our you know, everyday life at work or outside and that there are ways to reduce its impact. And since that's the key point of the presentation, let me briefly go over these ways to reduce it again. So what do what to do when a situation when you're in a situation where you need help? Uh, first of all, be explicit about it. Don't allow any ambiguity or people might not be aware that something is going on or that you need help. Make one person or multiple, but ideally name like ideally few people responsible for it. Make sure to be very clear about it. Name them, point at them, describe them, tag them in Slack, whatever. Tell them clearly what is the situation and what did they need to do. If the situation is dangerous, make sure you communicate it. And also, if it's not working, threaten them with physical violence because, as I mentioned before, the bystander effect is reduced when this is... Okay, yeah, please don't do that. Uh, that's not a nice thing to do. And like people will just not react well to that if you use it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Also, so don't take it personally if you ask a group of people and they don't help you. It's not you, it's them, it's the group. It's, you know, human nature. And for everyone, if you're not, not the one who needs help. And also, yeah, I'm aware that, you know, some of these things that I'm asking you to do are, like, uncomfortable. And ideally, you will not need to do this if the people who you are asking are aware of the bystander effect and proactively trying to reduce it. So hopefully after this presentation, nobody in the company will have to like be so explicit and like have to explain or threaten, don't threaten anyone. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> if everyone does the following things, it will be easier for everyone and nobody will have to do, go through the uncomfortable step of, you know, making people responsible like so much and bugging people to do things. So yeah, otherwise, Try to be aware of the situations in where you could intervene. Like be particularly particularly aware of situations when there are multiple people who could help and are all equally responsible, because that means that you know now that we are all aware of the bystander effect, we should be able to notice and predict that it will happen. That if there's a situation when there's a group of people, nobody or is likely to actually do something about it. So once you notice it, you know. Also trust nobody. Basically, if you see other people that they are not doing anything, don't take it as a proof that nothing needs, needs to be done. 
and act as if you were alone or if you are the first person to be witnessing it, like, you know, offer to help, speak up, make someone responsible because you now know that other people will not do it. And if you are not the right person and you know that, and like, you know, and, but you are aware of the situation, make the right person aware or raise the situation to the group's attention explicitly, or basically just do whatever is on the left column, ask them, make them responsible and so on. So now that you know all about this, I hope no pull requests go unreviewed and no calls for help go unheeded. These are the references in, of all the articles I mentioned in case any of you wants to take a look. And now I want each of you individually to think about the presentation. Consider if there are any questions or comments you'd like to make, if there are any things that were unclear, any curiosity you want to ask about or something. And if so, please voice them now. And remember that it's urgent. And if nobody asks in 20 seconds, the presentation will end and you will lose this opportunity forever. OK, I have something. <laughs> Yay. Great presentation, uh, Danny. And I want to not just thank you for putting that as an example, but actually, for example, Matt and the other person was Philip Heine. They solved actually a problem of one week, of one brown bag, but you stepped up to help me solve the whole problem for the future. So I want to say that I really appreciate that. And thanks for setting the expectations extremely high. What? Thank you for setting the expectation extremely high. No, I'm looking forward uh, to our meeting today to hear your ideas and mm -hmm. see. So, uh, we will great see. I'll make sure more people see it, huh? more than five. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wonder if you left your microphone off at the beginning, like on purpose, to see how much time it would take for someone to call. Ah. I'm unfortunately I'm not that uh, smart. I didn't think about doing that. I just it just happened. But good job, Alfred, for beating the mm -hmm. extended yeah. effect. Well, I have to admit, and and this is not a, a question <clears throat> necessarily, but uh, really more of another observation along the lines of what Razi just said. This is the second time that I've seen the, this presentation. We did a dry run earlier in the week with some others as well. And I just wanted to point out that Danny's uh, presentations are generally uh, above average. And um, that was the case of the first one. But the changes that he made to the presentation for today really put it over the top. So I think that's evidence of the fact that uh, a dry run really helps to make the presentations mm -hmm. great. It was a it was a fantastic presentation, Danny. Yeah, I, I think that's thanks to you and like all the other people who were like attended the run, dry run. The, the, all the comments were very useful, and I think I implemented all of them as I could. And I think the presentation was better because of that. So thank you. I don't know if you saw uh, Griffin's comment in the chat, but he asked if that was a halo above your head. Ah, yeah, something like that. I, I don't see myself now. I just have the, the PowerPoint on my head, so I didn't see anything. Uh, and maybe just another observation. It was interesting, and we discussed this at the dry run as well, uh, that the uh, initial situation and the article that uh, followed eventually turned out not to really be the case, but a little bit coincidentally that the, the condition or, or the, the bystander effect itself uh, actually did turn out to be true given all of the research and uh, that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, I... I... I actually noticed when you presented at the beginning, because I also heard about that case, and I remember reading a debunking uh, fairly recently. So I was like, no, it's not true. It's not true. Uh, and I was glad that you circled back to it at the end. But I do think that there was some truth to the story, right? Like, it wasn't that it was completely false and made up, but maybe they just exaggerated how severe mm -hmm. the bystander effect was to make the story a bit more interesting. Yeah, I think so. Like, I think that the, the, the thing happened, like, it's not completely false. And there were people who noticed it was just, yeah. Exaggerated, as you said. 
and like yeah i'm curious if anybody else has any uh observations of the bystander effect that they've experienced here at salcedo or elsewhere that they care to share whether that be something somewhat benign like a code review or if anybody has actually been in an emergency situation where they've witnessed this i wonder if some political problems where people don't stand up for their rights somehow relate to bystander effect as well <clears throat> Do you think it relate or it's totally different? Like I think this could happen, yeah. Like, like it's just yeah. The, basically, if there are multiple people and nobody is, feels more responsible than the others, or nobody seems to, you know, care enough, like it, this can happen in I think all sorts of situations. Is it not okay? Sorry, go ahead, Andy. I'm just saying it's in our case some situations, especially in emergencies, where bystanders may have an element of fear, um, where they where they see the emergency, they know that they should help, but they they may be concerned for their own safety. Like actually, the, if the situation is dangerous, the the bystander effect is reduced because like there's like a lot of theories about the people who wrote these articles and did the research but people think that the, like sometimes you need the physical safety of somebody else helping you like if mm -hmm. somebody you know there's a dangerous person with a knife and you are alone you're just not gonna go there but if there's five people with you maybe you, you will do something about it yeah. so that's a counter bystander effect but yeah in general the the more people there are, the, the less likely they are any to, to take responsibility. Maybe sort of a mix of Andy and Roman's question. Um, in your research, did you run across anything uh, regarding how this relates to activism, for example? And I think this is sort of what maybe Roman was getting at. He can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, on a mass scale, like in a political election or something like that, or, or just political issues in general where people um, don't just sit back, but actually actively participate in activism in one form or another. Did you read anything on how the two relate? I'm pretty sure there is some research about it, but did there, I didn't find that. Good topic for your next presentation. Maybe. Any more questions? As Danny said, this is your one and only opportunity. All right. Yeah. Danny, thanks again. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending.